In this lecture, I'm going to explain the mathematical framework that you need in order to describe the phenomena that we have seen and also to describe quantum computing and quantum communication. The framework is actually not that difficult. It is basically linear algebra. I'm not going to review linear algebra here. I'm assuming that you know this already. This includes in particular issues, topics like vectors, the dimension of a vector space, bases, scalar product, orthogonality and so on. Here you see a number of topics that I'm assuming that you are familiar with. In case any of these sound like gibberish to you, uh, then you should stop here, take a good book on linear algebra and refresh your memory of these basic concepts. Quantum theory is described in Hilbert space. Hilbert space is a vector space over the complex numbers. So you might be familiar with uh, linear algebra in uh, over the real numbers you might be familiar with real vector spaces quantum theory is described in a complex vector space in quantum theory one uses a special notation vectors are commonly denoted by so-called kets hilbert space is endowed with a scalar product and the scalar product in Hilbert space has the familiar properties. It is linear in the second argument, but be careful because it's a complex vector space. It's no longer linear in the first argument. It is anti-linear in the first argument. Also in contrast to the scalar product in a real vector space, it is not symmetric, but um, skew symmetric. So when you flip the arguments then you get a complex conjugation. So you see there are a few small modifications that are necessary when you go from a real vector space to a complex vector space. When you have the scalar product of two vectors or two kets in this typical quantum theory notation. Then there's also a shorthand notation for that and that's called the bra-ket notation. You see on the left hand side of this identity the first argument of the scalar product is written similar to a ket but with the uh, angular bracket on uh, the other side and then it looks very compact and the mathematical object on the left, so the first argument of the scalar product that's called a bra, and the object on the right, the second argument of the scalar product that's called a ket. And together they form, when you build, when you um, calculate the scalar product, when you write the scalar product, together they form a bra ket or a bracket. You can have operators acting on vectors in Hilbert space and there are um, a few concepts that I would like to stress when you have an operator acting on the second argument of a scalar product so that's on the right hand side of this equation then you can move the operator to the first argument of the scalar product and then this operator becomes its adjoint and it's denoted with a dagger that's called the A dagger operator. In a real Hilbert space that would be the transpose. In quantum theory we will see that important operators have the property that they are their own adjoint 
they are called self adjoint or Hermitian. And there's another class of operators of particular importance in quantum theory. These are the so-called unitary operators. Unitary operators are operators that preserve arbitrary scalar products. So if you have the, the a unitary operator acting on both arguments in, uh, of a scalar product, then that will preserve the original scalar product. Then there is an, a further category of operators which play a prominent role in the description of quantum theory. These are so-called projection operators. Here's a little picture that's uh, a three-dimensional real vector space. So think of the three-dimensional physical space that uh, surrounds us in order to visualize the concept. Imagine you have a vector v in that three-dimensional vector space and you have a two-dimensional plane spanned by here uh, two vectors u1 and u2. Then you can have an orthogonal projection of v onto that two-dimensional plane and the operator which effects this orthogonal projection is called a projector or a projection operator P. Such projection operators have two basic properties. They are self-adjoint, they are Hermitian, and they are idempotent. That is, if you apply two projections in a row, you have P squared then this is identical to a single projection. And that is very intuitive because once you've projected a vector onto your two-dimensional plane, applying one more time the same projection will not change the vector anymore because it's already in the two-dimensional plane. If the two vectors which span the two-dimensional plane are orthogonal, or more generally, if in your Hilbert space you have a k-dimensional subspace, which is spanned by k vectors, ui, and they are mutually orthogonal, and they are unit vectors, so they have length 1, then the projection operator can be written in this form. It's the sum over all, one says dyads, so this structure of a cat and a bra, it's called a dyad. And you sum over all these dyads corresponding to the vectors spanning your subspace. And the sum is the projection operator onto that subspace. So these are, this is the basic framework in which we will describe quantum theory complex Hilbert space that is a complex vector space with a scalar product and um, there are certain types of operators which play a particularly important role. These are Hermitian operators, unitary operators and projection operators. Talking about Hermitian operators, there is a basic result in linear algebra that says that any Hermitian operator can be written as a sum over some number, some AI, which is real, times projector PI, where the projectors project onto subspaces of your Hilbert space, which are mutually orthogonal. The AI in this decomposition are the eigenvalues of your Hermitian operator. There's a fundamental result that in complex Hilbert space, Hermitian operators have a real spectrum. All eigenvalues are real. And the projectors are the projectors 
onto the eigenspaces associated with these eigenvalues. And there's another fundamental result that the eigenspaces of a Hermitian operator are mutually orthogonal. The symbol on the right hand side that you see this delta ik, this is so called Kronecker delta. This is zero if i and k are different and it is one if i is equal to k. So pi, pk is zero if i and k are different. This reflects the fact that the eigen, different eigenspaces are orthogonal and it is um, pi, I, pi, pk is equal to pi if k is equal to i. So this reflects just the idempotence p squared is equal to p. Now we've assembled all the important ingredients to formulate the mathematical framework of quantum theory. There are four basic ingredients. To begin with, the state of a quantum system is described by a unit vector in Hilbert space up to some undetermined phase factor. This means that if a vector v, let's say a unit vector v describes a particular quantum state, then e to the i phi, where phi is an arbitrary angle, times this vector v describes the same physical quantum state. Next, an observable, that is a physical quantity that you can measure, is described by a Hermitian operator. The eigenvalues of this Hermitian operator correspond to the possible measurement values. So if you perform a measurement, you measure this particular observable, then the results, the possible results of your measurement, the possible measurement values that you can obtain are the eigenvalues of the corresponding Hermitian operator. Talking about measurements, when you do a measurement, then in general, the outcome of a measurement is not certain, but different possible outcomes occur with various probabilities. We saw that when we talked about quantum phenomena, about binary measurements, we saw that different, the two possible outcomes may occur with respective probabilities. Now, how do you calculate the probability of a particular measurement outcome? This is governed by the so-called Born rule. And the Born rule says that in a state Psi, so a state described by a ket, by a unit vector Psi, the outcome, let's call it X, of your measurement occurs with a probability which is given by the scalar product on the right hand side. So you have Psi, the bra Psi, the cat Psi, and in between you have the projector, the projection operators, operator which projects onto the eigenspace corresponding to the measured eigenvalue x. This is the Born rule for the probabilities. And then there is a second aspect to measurement in quantum physics, which you do not have in classical physics. A measurement generally changes the state of the system. So after a measurement, you have a new state, you have to update your state. And the way this is described mathematically, it is a projection of the original unit vector, describing the original state, onto the eigenspace corresponding to the measurement value that you have just 
obtained. This explains, for example, why the order of measurements matters. That was one of the characteristic features of quantum theory that we encountered in the previous lecture. Whenever you perform a measurement, you actually change the state of your system. And it makes a difference whether you first change the state in one way and then in another way or the other way around. So this is the starting point for describing that mathematically. Finally, you can transform a state. Not, you can change it not only by measurement, but you can um, also transform the state, for example, by rotating a system or by letting it evolve in time. And then it changes, it's transformed just by in time by the passing of time. Now such transformations which are not caused, or state changes which are not caused by measurement, uh, are described by unitary operators. And unitary operators we saw uh, have the property that they preserve scalar products. In particular, they preserve the normalization of a vector. So this ensures that if initially you had a unit vector, then after a unitary transformation, you will still have a unit vector and therefore a valid quantum state. And unitary transformations also preserve orthogonality. So if you have two vectors which were initially orthogonal and you transform them, then afterwards they are still orthogonal. This is, in a nutshell, what we will need in the coming lectures.